Oh, yeah. I already sat down this morning and sang at the piano for a little while, so I, I'll be okay, I hope. Um, I'm glad you guys are back. Y'all had a good breakfast, and um, I'm just glad you guys came back. Looked around earlier, and I was like, I can see it takes people a little longer to get going in the morning. That's okay. That's okay. I'm so glad y'all are here. Uh, let's, let's get started with a word of prayer, and then we'll go right into um, our worship time. Father, we're so grateful to be here this morning. We thank you that your mercies are new for us today, and uh, we're here again just waiting to hear from you, God. I thank you so much for the words we heard last night. Um, I thank you for the women who uh, prepared those words for us and, uh, through prayer and study. Um, just grateful for them. God, I pray that, again, as we come to you, uh, as we worship you, that you would be in our midst. I pray we'd lift our hearts um, purely in front of you, God. I pray that we would uh, sing words and mean what we sing. I pray that uh, as the teaching time comes, again, Lord, that we would hear exactly what you have to say to us. I pray that we'd listen diligently and, uh, and just learn what you have for us, God. Again, I thank you for everybody here. And we pray in your son's name, in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Ever be on my lips? 
praise you. You are great. We lift your name up. We exalt you, God. We praise you. And Lord, just as we sang, I pray that, that when we speak, that we're, that we're lifting you up. I pray that, that your praise is on our lips at all times. Uh, when it's hard, I pray it's still there. When it's good, I pray that it's even louder. God, I, again, I just pray that, um, that we listen to you. Because we know you're always here and you're always waiting on us. And so we come. We come to listen. We come to quiet our souls, to quiet our minds, and we come to listen to you and to what you have to say. So, Lord, teach us. We're here. We love you. And again, we thank you for all you've done for us. And we pray it in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody awake? Yeah. I'm a morning person. <laughs> Somebody in my house has to be. It's just two of us now. So. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for coming back. Um, please know that we love y'all so much. I looked out a while ago while Christine was singing. Here we go. <laughs> well, Christine was singing, and I thought, you know, I love these ladies so much. And you've been so kind about this weekend. And, um, Janice and I are in one agreement. This is this is our precious Lord and Savior giving us words, not us. Because we're totally insufficient to say what needs to be said, but he's all powerful. So thank you for being back. And um, God gave us an awesome morning, didn't he, to get out and start early. So thank you. Um, Janice is going to start us off this morning, and um, so we're ready to see what she has to say. You know, we, we're speaking on God being silent. So after I talked to Kim about speaking on when God is silent, God went silent. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, God, you told me to do this, and now you're not giving me any words to speak. <laughs> well, in the last two weeks, he gave me a flood of words to speak. But he kind of, he rationed them. And he, he didn't give me the final until Thursday night. <laughs> and Kim's coming up, how's it going? How's it going? I'm like, my points are changing. <laughs> Nothing's staying the same. So I think what we both started out with was not what, not what we, we ended, ended up with. with. Yeah. So let's go ahead and dive in. And we'll see if we can get y'all out before noon. Maybe one-ish. <laughs> no, we'll have you out. Um, the first topic this morning on why God is silent, sometimes God goes silent because he's, try, he's, he's teaching us. He's not trying to teach us, but he is teaching us to distinguish between his voice and the voices of others. He wants us to know his voice in, even in the sense of I think Kim was talking last night about how God doesn't scream at you. He doesn't. Sometimes he screams at me because he has to. Um, but most of the time, God's just kind of tapping you on the shoulder going, Janice, Janice, do you hear me? He wants me to listen to him. He doesn't want to have to yell. He doesn't want to have to scream above the fray of, of the things going on in our life. He wants us to... Y'all all know, sometimes life gets difficult. It gets hard. The kids are screaming. Your husband is wanting, where, are, where is my belt? Where are my shoes? And the kids are like, I can't find my left shoe. Where did it go? And then they're having a meltdown because things aren't going their way. And then you're like, okay, I don't get to have a meltdown. I have to keep it all together so I can keep them all together, right? Y'all didn't know I knew that. I don't even have kids. <laughs> <laughs> There's one key to that, though. I were one. 
And I remember how things were in my house growing up. Anyway, God wants us to hear his voice. When he speaks to us in that still, small voice, he wants us to know that it is his voice. His voice should be distinguishable above any other voice out there. It should be distinguishable above your boss's voice. It should be distinguishable above your husband's voice, your best friend's voice, your voice, and most of all, it should be distinguishable above Satan's voice. Because I kid you not, Satan will try to make his voice sound like God's. So, how do I distinguish between his voice and the voice of others? First point is, his sheep hear his voice. So number one is that you have to be his sheep. In John 10, 1 through 10, it tells us, Truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters, excuse me, the one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeepers open it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. Did you catch that? The sheep hear his voice. Remember, the, 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 let me tell you one thing about sheep. They're dumb. They're as dumb as a stump. They will walk right off a cliff if you don't stop them. Um, and I did not just call y'all dumb, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Jesus said again, Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep doesn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. Did you catch that? He came so that we could have life, but so that we could have it in abundance. Doesn't mean things are always going to go great. Doesn't mean things we're always going to have it all together. But we can have abundant life in him. To the point where even when things are swirling around us, our confidence isn't in the things that are swirling around us, but our confidence is in him. In order to distinguish between his voice and the voice of others requires one very important factor. Can anybody guess what that factor is? You have to be his sheep. You must be his child, his sheep. In order to be his sheep, you need to surrender your life, your will, your everything to his will. So in other words, it's not, I'm going to make God, I'm going to make my will God's will. No. We make God's will our will. In John 10, 26 through 30. But you don't believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jesus is the Father. The Father is Jesus. They're all one. Yet, they're three separate entities. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, so just like we did yesterday morning, or yesterday morning, last night, <laughs> <laughs> just as we did then, we're, right now we're going to go ahead and get the elephant out of the room. You may ask, how do I know that I am his child? 
because that can be known. It's not a, well, I hope I'm his child. Well, he created me, so I must be his child. No, no. You must understand that God created man in his image, and when he created them, they were perfect. However, sin entered the world through Adam. If anybody ever asked you, he messed it up for all of us, though. <laughs> he was standing right there. Not only did this result in physical death, but it also resulted in spiritual death. Man is now separated from God because of sin. This is a little phrase here, but it's a wonderful phrase. But God sent his one and only perfect son to be born of a virgin, to die on the cross, and to rise again on the third day as an atonement for our sins. When we pray realizing that we are hopeless in our sins and call on the name of Jesus and repent of our sins, Jesus immediately saves us and sends the Holy Spirit to live within us. He doesn't leave us on our own. He sends us, the, he, he sends us a helper, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that guides us, that convicts us. And I don't know about y'all, but I would rather be guided than convicted. So when he guides, lead. Because if you don't follow his guidance, he's going to convict. Repentance means that we acknowledge our sins and we turn completely away from them and follow Christ. <clears throat> when we have known sin in our life, in other words, like Kim said last night, when sin comes knocking at our door and we choose to follow that sin, we have made a conscious decision to sin. That doesn't mean we can't be forgiven, but we've got to turn away from that sin. So if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, the main thing that you need to do at this point is to ask him to forgive you of all those past sins to come into your heart and to save you. Mean, and it doesn't stop there. Then you turn from all those past sins and you follow him you live for him daily you pray to him daily you get in his word daily just as we talked last night okay second you have to learn to distinguish his voice Jeremiah 17 9 and 10 and 1 John 4 1 speak about this it's the question I asked before this is have you ever asked yourself, how do I know that this is something God wants me to do or if it's just something that I want to do? You with me here? A lot of times, well, even with this conference, I'm like, okay, is this something I want to do, Lord, or is it something you want me to do? And then I realized this is something that I would never want to do on my own. <laughs> <laughs> so it had to be a God thing. In Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, it says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, examine the mind. I test the heart. I test the heart to give to each according to his way, according to what his actions deserve. And in 1 John 4, 1, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone, up, have gone out into the world. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. Even now, it is already in the world. And I believe that. God is always going to be teaching us something. Make sure that make sure that what we hear or what we think we hear, no matter how spiritual it may sound, and I'm telling you, there's some people out there that can make sin sound spiritual. It's, it, it, it's amazing to me. But no matter how spiritual it may sound, make sure it lines up with what the Word of God teaches if it doesn't line up with what the Word of God teaches, I would run, and I would run hard. Um, remember, Satan also uses scripture. We talked about the temptation on the temple on the mount last night. 
Satan used scripture, but he took it out of context. And Jesus would quote the full context to him. Um, so make sure that Brad often says some of these pastors you listen to on the Devil Channel. Be careful with, with some of the speakers that are out there because they may say these flowing spiritual words that sound so good and you think, oh yeah, man, that just sounds so good. It must be from God. Go back and test it. Make sure that whatever scripture they have, especially if it's just one verse, go back. Read it in context and make sure it says what they said it said. Because you can take one verse out of scripture and make it say anything you want. Mm -hmm. And that, that that's just a dangerous road to go down. Um, I keep getting there. Ask yourself, is this something I want so badly that I am hearing only what I want to hear? Remember, our own hearts deceive us. People say, follow your heart. No. I'm going to sit here and tell you, do not follow your heart. Your heart will deceive you. This is why it is so important to be in God's word, studying his word and listening to his word. The best way to know if it is you wanting something or God telling you he wants you to be doing something, read his word. He'll give you affirmation through his word. Get in the book and let it speak to you. And I know as I'm talking, you're probably thinking, you know, this is a lot of work. Well, life is work. And if you want to know how to live it, and you want to know how to live it to its fullest, get in the Word of God and let Him tell you how He wants you to live it. And I'm telling you, the best way... <laughs> it is so much easier to go the way God wants you to go than to fight against the way He wants you to go. It's kind of like swimming against the current? What, what's the easier way to do it? You swim with the current. You swim against the current and what's going to happen? You're going to tire out a whole lot quicker than you would if you just went with the current. So go with God's current. Don't fight against him. Just let him lead you and do what he wants you to do. Um, God's word is his word. It's infallible. And it's given to us in love. You know the voice of your husband because you spend time with him, right? You can spot his voice in a crowd full of men. Because you love him. You know what his voice sounds like. You've spent time with him. You know your child's cry. You know your child's voice in a room full of kids. And your back is turned to them. You know that voice when you hear it. You, you know that cry if they cry out. It's the same way with God. He knows each one of our voices. And when we cry out to him, he'll respond to us. But you've got to wait for his response. Sometimes we're so busy talking and complaining to God that we can't hear his response, kind of like what Kim was talking about last night. We're not ready to listen. We're not ready to hear him. Well, sometimes we don't hear him because we haven't shut up yet. And I'm the, I, I get that way. I'm like, you know, Lord, why haven't you done anything about this? I just don't understand. Why are you leaving us floundering out in this wilderness here? And he's like, well, you know, if you'll ever shut up, I'll tell you. Our response to his silence in this instance is listen for his voice and learn to distinguish his voice by getting to know him through time and his word. Any input, any questions? They still love you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to make a comment, not necessarily a question, and you cleared up some things about the voice of God. Uh, I, I like why you said it was an audible voice, and sometimes I, I guess I was expecting him to 
shaking. Come on, Carol, <laughs> wake up, do this. But I, I, I needed to hear this today because of a crisis that I've been through. No, it was just a plain loss. And I, for a long time, I, I uh, said I should have done more. My sister passed, my best buddy. And I had such an extreme loss. And one way that I'm able to go on, I, had, I knew that I had to fill up that loss, that barrel with more God. And, and I know God controls all, he knows all, and it, it was his decision. But I, I just couldn't, uh, I'm getting past the thought that that was more that I could have done. And I guess I'm realizing that if, if God wanted her to, to live, if I didn't hear, he would have motivated somebody else mm -hmm. to do it. He would have fixed those circumstances. So I'm just saying that's good for me to hear, not necessarily a question, but that you all are reiterating what the scriptures say. You know, I'm hearing it from other sheep, you know. And sometimes that's what we need. Sometimes we need that affirmation. Um, and a lot of times God works through loss. And he knows that in our loss that we are going to grieve. But as we're grieving, grieve with him. Yeah. And let him come alongside you and, and walk you through that grief. And he'll do it. And it, it's, hard to love. It, it's hard to lose someone you love. Um, it's very difficult, but he'll be there. He'll walk. With, and I'm telling you, sometimes it's not even you doing the walking; it's him carrying you through the valley. A lot of times. Anybody else? One thing that comes to my mind is that when we think God is silent, when I think I'll just personalize it, when I think God is being silent. And what I need to remember is his character. And his character is that he's always at work. And whether Betty Huggins can see it or not is not the point. You know, the Lord is not in heaven saying, man, I wish you could see why I'm at heaven. You know, that's, that's not the point. The point is that he is at work, whether I see it or not. And he does not owe us an explanation for anything. Um, we may someday know why about some things, and then again, we may not. Uh, I don't think Job ever knew why is a great example, you know. Yeah, we're not told that he did. We're not, we're not told that, you know, and I just, I don't think the Lord owes us that at all, but we do need to remember that even if we can't see him at work, even if we don't hear him speaking, that doesn't mean nothing's happening. That's right. Remember, there was, there was 400 years between the Old Testament in the New Testament that God was just silent but he was working he was preparing hearts and lives and circumstances for his son to come and be born of a virgin uh, there, there's several times in scripture where God went silent he went silent on Moses for several years before Moses finally saw him in the burning bush. I think it was from the time that Moses um, fled Egypt to the time that he saw God in the burning bush. God was silent all that time and what he was working for his father-in-law. So always know, and she's right, always know that even though he's silent, even though we may feel Deserted, And by the way, we cannot base our salvation or our walk with God on our feelings because, again, our feelings, our heart is deceitful. And our feelings can fool us. So always know that he's working. He, he, he may not be saying anything at the moment, but it doesn't mean he's mad. Well, usually if he's angry, he lets you know. <laughs> but I think if we would look at God's silence, I think the first thing we need to do is check, okay, am I okay with God? Is there anything blocking my relationship with the Father? 
And then the next is, okay, I've, I've, I've got all that right, but he's really, I'm still not getting a picture of where to go from here. When that happens, stay put. Never make a major decision during a time when you're not hearing from God. Because more than likely, it's going to be a knee-jerk decision, and it's going to be the wrong one. Because you're going to base it off of your heart and your feelings instead of off of what God wants. Wait for Him to speak. Because what, what you've got to realize is even though He's silent, eventually He is going to speak. He's not going to stay that way. He's just teaching us things. And we need to... Like she said, find the character of God. God's silence should motivate us to find his character. And what, what are the characters? He's got many. He's, his compassion, love, working, preparing. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on. A lot of times when God is silent... There is literally a spiritual warfare being fought that we can't see. Which is one of the reasons that you do not need to make major decisions when you're not hearing from God. Because we're not in the right frame of mind to do that. Um, I've had a lot of, in the last few years, had a lot of health issues. And try to stay upbeat knowing God's got a plan or hey, he, or, he even took me at that time home. And so I was telling Kim and Janice, few weeks ago I was having a little little moment, I was having a little me moment, <laughs> wondering why, you know, all of a sudden things will go good for a while and then something will happen and bring you right back to a low point. And this song by Hillary Scott came on the radio and it's called Steel. And it says, you're parting waters making a way for me, you're moving mountains that I don't even see. You've answered my prayer before I even speak, all you need for me is to be still. And it hit me at that moment is that sometimes we have those moments to where that's what he brings us to the moments to be still so that we can hear what he wants us to hear. I think a lot of times the hardest thing for a wife and a mother to do is to be still. It, it's just a really hard thing we're, we're, we're so used to doing. Um... So it, it gets difficult to just sit and be still and listen because you've always got that feeling, I need to be doing something. I know she does. <laughs> I, I, I need to be doing this. I need to be doing that. Oh, I've got, I need to be doing laundry. I need to vacuum the floors. I need to mop the floors. I need to cook supper. I need to get this done. I need to get that done. When all God is saying is, I want to spend time with you. And I think that's, I think a lot of times that's what his silence is about. I just want to spend time with you. And think about that. I said this last night. Think about that. God, he's the creator of the universe. He's not just the creator of man or the creator of the earth. He created it all, people. He created the stars, the moon, the sun. He created the climate change. <laughs> he created it all. And he wants to spend time with you. Individually. He wants to... What, what's some of the best things women do? do, do? There we go. <laughs> we love on people. We love on kids. We, it, it's, we nourish it's a natural outflowing. Yes? That's what I was about to say. Um, I, I, I am teaching, after 30 years of teaching, I was telling them, I did 28 of them at Northwest Florence. Um, love. Love. We know that the Lord loves us. And I, too, um, went through a lot of illness, up and down. And I often would tell myself, I know the Lord loves me. No matter what, hills, valleys, 
ups, downs, ins, outs. He loved you. And why would he stop on September 21st, 2019, when he decide, okay, Marie, hold on, drop you here today. <laughs> I'm yeah. you off on the side of the highway. I have enough of them. <laughs> He's not. No matter what. That's right. He's going to love us. Nothing so, separates us. I think as women, sometimes Jesus. we're really good at loving on somebody. Yeah. But to stop and be still and be loved on, mm -hmm. we don't do such a good job sometimes. Because we, like, like I said last night, that sense of responsibility within us, you know, Man, I want to be, I want to be hugging and loving on somebody, but to stop and just let somebody love on me or do for me, uh, I'm not really good at sometimes. And even with that, even with the, you know God being the one loving on me, so. And I think sometimes that's why God brings certain circumstances into our life. He 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 wants to love on us. He also wants other people to love on us. He wants us to allow other people. To, to love on us, to help us. The, the ones that I notice this that have the hardest time with this are those with the gift of service. They're the ones that are always serving. But if you flip that table on them and you want to serve them, it's very difficult for them to receive that. But yet, they need to learn to receive that. Because it, it's all part of it. We are, we are to serve one another. Which means I serve you. But at some point, I need to, let, I need to allow you to serve me. Kim's, ser Kim's probably one of the... She hates it. When I do it. <laughs> she is probably one of the best examples of the servant heart that that I could give. And she she loves it. She loves serving other people. She loves doing all this other stuff for people. But I think one of her most difficult things is to sit back and let someone else serve her. You know, you are absolutely right. It is dawning on me now on the serving. That's my nature too. And my sister, I'm the oldest child in the family. I'm the oldest grandchild. So everybody, and my mother was a, a caretaker, so I inherited all of that. So in my wildest dreams, I never would imagine that God would take my one of my siblings, anybody younger than me, before I went. I just, I mean, I just could not phantom that. And I know the people that I talked to, some ministers saying, you know, God is in control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I done heard that for 66 years. <laughs> but I, I need something else. You know what I mean? So. In other words, you didn't want to hear that part yet. I didn't want to hear that. And, you know, and I kept saying, you know, Lord, I, I'm missing something. What, what's going on here? And I guess I wasn't being served until the meanest lady where I work at. Now, people don't like it, but she knew I was grieving. And she said, listen, young lady, I might treat you bad, but I love you. <laughs> and she told me, and I did this, she said she experienced the loss of a child, of a child committing suicide and their parents died. She said, you won't find any peace until you focus out. Everybody else, we're blind, and it's you and God. So I think that Friday morning I was off. I pulled out all my Bibles. I buy scriptural books. And I laid them in, and I started reading. It was about 9, and when I looked up, it was 1 o'clock. And I said, wow. You know, that was some me and God fellowship. It was just the two of us. Mm -hmm. And I felt better. You know, I, I yeah. was fed off of his food, not this other stuff. Right. Excuse me, I, I'm, I get choked up. <laughs> but anyway, this is good. And the clocks, I couldn't understand them, but time. We don't have time for foolishness. Right. We got to serve God, you know. But anyway, okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just have to say this. <laughs> 
Last night when Kim read that poem, A Place I Hate to Be, that was definitely from God, from God to me. And I'm sure it spoke to others here, but I'm in a place that I hate to be. And this has been going on for a while, and I have questioned God about it. I don't have an answer. But you know, he gives me the strength each day. I ask for strength for the next day. And sometimes I just have to be quiet. I have to be silent. But right. anyway, that was a blessing to me. The person that, that wrote that is very dear to me. Really? Because she's my sister. <laughs> Mom, I would like to have a copy of that. I oh, would. She wouldn't mind. I'll, I can get, can we get, is there a way I can get that print at all? That was just something that came straight but, from her heart. Uh, you know, it's always easier to pray for other people than it is yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my pastor said Wednesday night, he said, sometimes the reason we don't do that is because we don't feel like we deserve it. And it's always easier to pray for others than yourself. A lot of this is finding your worth in Christ. Instead of finding your worth in your kids, instead of finding your worth in your job, um, instead of finding your worth even in your church. I mean, I think a lot of times we look at church as our spiritual thermometer. Um, so, so we gauge how we're doing spiritually by how many times we're in church. Well, you know, that kind of gets blown out of the water when you're a pastor and a pastor's wife. Because you're kind of required to be there. The congregation starts kind of looking down on it when they see the pastor's wife not coming to church. Uh -huh. Another thing we lose our self-worth is we're not looking for it. We're not looking for affirmation from God. And mm. I can justify that because, I mean, I've been married for well, 26 years. And I guess I would say in the last year and a half, um, my husband has affirmated the fact of how much he loves me treats me like a queen and just and he has never or at least I say I, uh, like I say I wasn't ready to get it I wasn't ready to receive it I guess because I never heard all that affirmation I never heard all that tenderness and that love and that and you know that I think God was going through him for me to take it in and to try to accept that because up to that point I never never heard it because I wasn't ready to hear it like you talked about last night mm -hmm. so our word is in Christ because in and of ourselves we're, we're really not worth much but in Jesus Christ we're worth everything because God sent his son to die on the cross for us and if we're God's child if we have ask Jesus to come into our heart and save us and to change our lives and we have surrendered our life to him when God looks on us he sees his son so let that sink in he sees his son and he loves us with the same love that he has for his son I don't there's no way and moms can affirm this there's no way that if God didn't love us with a pure and everlasting love that he would have sent his only son to die on the cross See? <laughs> yes ma'am when my husband passed away a few months after that I was having a bad night and I went and got his Bible and opened it up. And in the front of it, he had written down all the scriptures in the Bible dealing with grief. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And I read every one of them. And God gave me a certain amount of peace back. Wow, that's good. But just know that in and of ourselves, this is going to sound harsh. 
in and of ourselves, we're worthless. Sometimes truth is hard. But in and of ourselves, we are worthless. But through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we are everything. Through God, there's nothing that we can't do as long as it is what he wants us to do. Now, you go out and do something that God doesn't want you to do and what, he will watch you fall flat on your face. I've done that more times than I care to admit. But and then, and then the things that he wants me to do, I do kicking and screaming because I don't want to do them. <laughs> so, okay, it's it's yours. Okay, I'm not leaving, but I gotta <laughs> move my chair because I'm all up on this table and I can't even see table number one over here. <laughs> and I wish y'all could. Uh, Stand back from this side because Janice has hers all <laughs> neatly on this computer with yellow and purple highlights. And Kim has this scraggly <laughs> piece of paper with notes written all over. So, two extremes here. All right. Um, that was great. That was really good. That was good. All right. Question How do we continue to have faith and trust in the time of silence? Um, I think that that poses another question when I ask that question. In my life, am I rooted in the reality of God's presence, not just in the consciousness of God's presence? Yes, I can, I can say God's there, like Janice has mentioned before. I can say God's there, and I know he's there, but do, do I live in the reality that he's there? Do I walk every day knowing that the Holy Spirit is within me and empowering me to do what God has directed me to do. And it's a whole, a whole, that's a whole world in between. I mean, Satan recognizes God. So for me to just say that, yeah, I know God's here it is one thing, but I have to live knowing he's, he's in my life. Um, to me, it's the difference in basing my life on an emotion versus a promise. God promises he's going to be there. Um, Hebrews 13, 5 tells us, I will never leave you nor abandon you. So the silence doesn't mean that he's left me alone, like you said. The silence doesn't mean he's thrown me off on the side of the road and said, I'll be back later when you get your stuff together. He's He's right there with me as the as what we read last night said he's he's right there i may have to hit the bottom but he's still right there he's at the bottom with me um second corinthians 5 7 tells us for we walk not by sight but by faith and we talked about the times of silence in the bible think of abraham and sarah between genesis 12 and 18 after god told abram that he would be the father of many nations he didn't say anything else about it and nothing certainly was happening as far as him becoming a father. You know, God, the God didn't, he made a promise and he left it alone. Think about Joseph as a young, young boy and the dreams that he had and the dreams he told his brothers. And then think of all that transpired. You know, his brothers throwing him, th selling him and him going to prison. And, you know, God, just because God was silent, didn't mean we know that God wasn't at work for the great plans he had for him. Um, and I think maybe Betty and I are sisters because every time we talk, we, have, we find more in common. But like she said, and Janice can testify this, every time we got together to talk about this, I would always would go back to God's character. Always go back to God's character. Um, God, this, God's silence doesn't change his character. Never, it does not change his character. He, um, it doesn't change his heart. Think about so many attributes of God's character. But in this, in this text, think about God is not a deceiver. <coughs> he doesn't have any ulterior motives. He cannot act in opposition to his character. He cannot be untrue. He cannot be unloving. 
He cannot be irresponsible. He cannot be uncaring. He is never impulsive. He's never unstable. And he's never fickle. Because of that, because I know that, because that is reality, then I can step out in faith and know that he's right there with me. So don't use the silence to distrust him. You know, when my kids were getting old enough to take some responsibility and do things on their own and started thriving and things like that, we used to always tell them, we said, we trust you to prove us otherwise. Once you prove me otherwise, then life changes. But I trust you to prove me otherwise. You know, God's never going to prove us otherwise. He can't. That's not God. Um, and I'll go ahead and say, Brother Brad, this is part of one of his sermons. Ms. Lord? Uh, what you were saying, Kim, we need to remember that we have uh, an enemy. Yes, and ma'am. sometimes it's the accuser who seizes on our weaknesses and uh, shortcomings and elevates them to the point that we wonder whether we can really be in the truth. But in 1 John 3, 19 and 20, it tells us, and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. So. We need to be aware that there is an accuser out there. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, I, I wrote this down one Sunday morning because Brother Brad had used it in his sermon in, um, talking about faith. Um, that if we base our circumstances without struggle, if our faith is based on circumstances where we're in a really good time, no struggle, no suffering. All our days are going well. You know, the kids are good. Husband's taken care of. And we know God is blessing us. You know, it's a good day. The sun's shining. If that's the days that our faith is based on, <coughs> then we're fixing to fall down really hard. Because that's, it's, those, those are the easy days. You know, those aren't the hard days when you lose someone you love. When you watch someone that you love just fade away, um, those are the hard days. But those are the days, once again, you go back to God's character. He hasn't left you. He hasn't deceived you. He didn't, he didn't make a promise he couldn't keep. Um, then we go back. We go back to his word. We go back to Romans 10, 17 that tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Psalm 37, 7. And I'm going to read that one. Um, this is a great verse. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way by the person who carries out evil plans. Be silent before the Lord. God himself told us that. In other words, we have to be still, we have to be quiet, but we have to be reading what he's already spoken here and listen. We go back again, like Jan's mentioned this morning, how, how hard it is to be still. Our flesh wants us to move forward, even if it's the wrong direction, if we're just moving, just, just keep moving, things will get better. Sometimes we do have to stop because if we use that time when we stop and we're still, sometimes things don't look as bad as what they really might be. Sometimes I know, you know, think of your days when you don't stop from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. And in the midst of that, you've got something on your mind, something heavy on your heart. And, and you just keep moving all day long because really I don't want to stop and I don't want to think about it because it's bad. And maybe it will get better between 5 this morning and 10 o'clock tonight when I look back, think back on it again. Maybe if I had stopped and 
just let God blow on me that day and minister to me that day. <clears throat> I might see where he was in it all the, all the time, where he had made provisions for me all the <coughs> while, but I was too busy to stop and think about it. Um, isolation. That's kind of a it's kind of a big deal to me. Um, you know, the world we live in is is not still and it's not quiet. It's very noisy, it's very chaotic. And if we don't once again I go back to purposely being still. If we don't purposely be still, if we don't make ourselves available to God then all that noise deafens us to what God's trying to say, <coughs> what God's trying to, to do in our lives. And with that deafness, we, our conscious, consciousness almost becomes numb. We almost, here comes that wall that we're so good at building up between us and what we don't want to hear, what we don't want to do. And I don't know about y'all, but it's so easy to isolate yourself because people are so disconnected now. I mean, you know, I'll throw them a text, and I'm guilty of this too, you know. I'll throw somebody a text to let them know that I'm praying for them, or I'll throw them a text to say this or that, you know. I mean, we live in a very disconnected world. I mean, friendship is, and, and I mean, I'm old, but I'm not, that, I'm not that old that I don't remember, you know, that you, you know, walked across the street and talked to somebody. Or you called somebody up, you know, and said, hey, let's get together and, you know, do something. Um, and like Betty and I were talking about this morning, even, we were talking about hospitality. My goodness, that's like been lost in today's world, you know? When was the time when, you know, you invited somebody over for dinner and you cooked and you set the table and, um, you know, you just enjoyed having people over? Young women don't know, any, they just don't, that is not in their mindset anymore. I mean, I work with, with girls that, you know, have children and they still don't know how to cook. And, and I'm not saying, and like Betty and I said, that's not eternal significance, but the relationships you build and the connections you make are so important. Um, it's, it's just almost a lost art nowadays. But because we live so disconnected, it is so easy to just remove ourselves from relationships or from friendships and and throw that pity party you know and oh woe is me and I must I'm sure I'm the only one that's having this kind of day and you know Satan is standing right there waiting for that moment because once you isolate yourselves once you remove yourself from friendships from relationships and from God, then he goes to work. He leads us into a, a season where we don't recognize what God has done. We recognize what God hasn't done that we thought he should have done. Um, I was reading in part of my readings to get ready for this, um, I was reading a book that my Hannah had given me years ago by um, Elizabeth George, and there's a part in there where she talks about how we're so good at making our own crosses, and she, she, she had one sentence in there, and she said, you know, God gives us a path, and it runs north and south, and we see it, but we choose to go east and west, so we're going perpendicular to this north and south. And so what have we done? We created one more cross to carry because we couldn't follow. We felt like we had to go the opposite direction. Um, so 
I would encourage you as women to, to like we always say, to stay in the Word. And like you said, that's where we need to be. There's times when we've got to be. It's just got to be us and God. But at the same time, surround yourself with women. Because, you know, like we said, we, like, we love to love on each other. And we've all been there and done that. You know, and we, sometimes you just have to, you have to be the one that's loved on. You don't have to always be the one that's loving on somebody. And someone told me one time, um, I think it was when my dad passed away, because we had been years where he had been sick. And, you know, I had just done that one foot in front of the other day by day for a long, long time. And, um, when he passed away. I thought, you know, I just got to keep doing that one foot in front of the other. I just got to keep on. Because if I stop, I don't know that I can get back up. Because, I, you know, my daddy was so dear to me. I was, I was a daddy's girl. And um, somebody told me, you know, if you don't let somebody love on you, you've robbed them of a blessing too. They, that's, their, that's their ministry. Don't rob them of that just because you think you can reciprocate. Um, so, I don't know if anybody's got anything else they want to say. I've got um, Psalms 46. This is just a great verse, and it's just, it's just a great verse, so I just want to read it. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth crumbles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea, though its waters roar and foams and the mountains quake with its turmoil, God is our refuge and our strength. Yes, ma'am. You know, um, I was a daddy's girl, too. I remember when my daddy died when I was 23, my mama came up to me and my sister and said, you are hurting so bad. We are all hurting so bad because you were loved so much. And so many people will never know how to love you. That's right. You know, we're the lucky ones. That's right. And then when she died, you know, that came back to me. And then when my sister died, I had to pull that up again, you know, to realize we're the lucky ones, you know. We have the love that God meant for us to have through him, you know, all along. And look around in this horrible world out there, so many people will never know a great father's love or a great mother's love or a great, you know, bondship between sisters. And I've tried to tell myself that a lot of times when I want to get down, you know, well, I have nobody, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had it great. Mm -hmm. And so all we're left to do is to pass that love along to each other and to honor them, which is honoring God through that love, because God is love. Now, does that always work? No. And that's because Satan's right there going, ah, you know. <laughs> I just a bunch of words. No, it's not. It's, it's pulled me through many, many, many a bad day. So I sympathize with you and your sister. We had a great love, too. But I can also rejoice in saying I had that. All right. You know, I had it. Thank you. So we're lucky. <laughs> This is that moment where you realize why you do women's conferences. And I know Kim talked on this. We don't we don't get together 
what the way families did when we were growing up. We don't do it anymore. I remember growing up after church on Sunday nights, we would go over to a friend's house. The kids would play. The parents would <coughs> sip coffee and talk. And you don't see a lot of that anymore just because of the busyness of life, I guess. But when we come together as one... I have worked in offices filled with women. And one thing I learned is that we can be mean. <laughs> we can be very mean to one another. That's not what God wants. We have a conference like this. And what ends up happening, we find all the things that we have in common. We find, hey, someone is going through this. I've been through this. Maybe I can help. And I think that all along that this is what God intends. He never intended for any of us to be an island among ourselves. He created us with the desire not only for fellowship with him, but for fellowship with one another. And I think a lot of times as women, we fail each other in that point. And I'm not criticizing. I'm just stating a fact. I think a lot of times we fail one another in that point. And... I do. Life takes over for me at times, and you kind of, you, you turn inward, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You turn inward, and you don't see the other people out there. And I think a lot of times God takes us through certain things because he knows someone else is fixing to go through it, and he wants you to be able to come alongside that person and hold them up. And that's what we're meant to do as, as God's children, as Christ followers in this walk together. God never intended it to be a road we walked alone. He always intended it to be a road that we walked with others. And if you're lucky, God sends some good friends <laughs> to, to help. And, and too, you know, you talk about all these changes within us. There's one thing that God created hour time commitment that's gone unchanged yep. it's our choice as to what we prioritize our time with so we don't have to bow the culture we can live a peculiar life that's good yeah. I wish I had we don't have to bow the culture we can yeah. live a peculiar, a peculiar life. life I mean that's that's a bible word I didn't make that point. I think that's just, you know, I mean, living a different kind of life. That's yeah. what we're called to. And we, we're we should appear people. different to the world. We're a peculiar people. Right. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. We should appear different to the world. We, we shouldn't be so much like the world that the world can't tell that we're a child of God. They need to see that we are a child of God. And if we're living like the world, if we're acting like the world, why, why would the world want to receive Christ? If you love the world, God's not in you. He tells you it's not. That's right. Job, right. <laughs> okay. We are going to take about a 10-minute break, and then we'll get back at it at about... 10 30. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back at it at about 10 30. And, uh, but coffee up there. There's Brad's back there going like this. There's still food back there on the table. So help yourselves, and we'll come back and have our last session after that.